Hi, I'm Rob Mickelson. I'm the Director of Agronomic Services for Yara in North America, and pleased to continue this discussion with you today talking about calcium. In our first video of this series, we talked about the behavior and chemistry of calcium in the soil. And today we want to focus on the plant, looking at root uptake, calcium's role in the plant, its effect on disease and deficiency symptoms, and then crop quality. So let's begin talking about the roots. Recall that calcium is primarily taken up from the soil solution at the root tips, and then it moves up the plant to the place with the highest water loss, which is usually the leaves at the top of the plant. Recall that calcium is not mobile in the plant and doesn't move in the phloem. So it generally accumulates in the plant tissues or those places in the plant where water is being lost through transpiration. That close linkage of calcium and water uptake explains why any water-related problem, such as drought, flooding, wind, foggy conditions or cloud, cloudy skies, they all influence transpiration and the uptake of calcium. Recall that calcium uptake occurs only at the root tips from the soil solution, and it comes to the root primarily through mass flow. And the reason for the calcium uptake only at the root tips is as the older roots develop, they form an interior barrier we call the Casparian band which prevents calcium from being taken up. That Casparian band also protects the roots from other chemical and physical damage, so it is important, but that strip also prevents the uptake of calcium once it gets formed in the root. So young, healthy root tips are essential for getting soluble calcium into the plant. You may have seen pictures of roots like this before, where the absence of adequate calcium causes root growth to slow down or even to stop entirely. In extreme conditions, the root tips can completely die. Recall that calcium is essential in the formation of those plant cells and membranes. So when calcium is lacking in those roots, those young root tips die, and that makes it even more difficult for calcium to be taken up into the plant. So remember that roots can't store excess calcium, but they need a continual supply. This example shows the rate of soybean root growth with and without an adequate calcium supply. You can see that the root growth almost stops completely when the calcium supply is withdrawn, just within a few hours. In addition to root growth, other important rhizosphere processes are impacted by a shortage of calcium such as the association with mycorrhizal fungi and the ability of rhizobia to fix nitrogen for the plant. So let's spend the rest of our time with a brief review of the role of calcium in the plant. There's far too many things to go into detail here, but there's a nice review paper that was published a few years ago by Bang et al. that goes into many of these physiological aspects of calcium in great detail. For example, the role of calcium as a structural element and how it helps to bind the cell walls and membranes together. Calcium also has an important role as a plant signal. It's used as a messenger within the plant. It signals responses to various stresses and transport functions within the plant. And the signaling function is closely tied to calcium transport within the plant. You'll recall that calcium is transported in the xylem in the plant and moves with the transpiration stream to areas where water loss is greatest. So there's very poor movement of calcium in the phloem of the plant. We're also learning more about how calcium plays a central role in nutrient sensing and adapting the plant to changes in nutrient status. This calcium signaling is not only involved in intracellular regulation, but contributes to long-range signals across the plant. And the signaling is triggered by various physiological responses and stresses. And we've already discussed how calcium is virtually immobile in the phloem. This implies that calcium does not move from one part of the plant to another. And so there's very limited translocation from the old plant parts up to the young leaves and fruit. 
So the fruit and the young growing tissue depends on the xylem for delivery of continually adequate calcium concentrations. Again, this explains why any water-related conditions, drought, water, water logging, fog, cloudy skies, can all bring about calcium-related quality problems. We've discussed the importance of calcium for preventing plant deficiencies, but these deficiencies often show up on the leaves as necrotic lesions on the leaf margins. Sometimes the leaf tips turn brown or yellow. Sometimes we see cup-shaped leaves. In grasses, sometimes the leaves become spiraled. And then later on, the growing point actually dies because the plant can no longer make new cells and membranes. So all these aspects of calcium nutrition, whether it be the role in the plant structure or the role of calcium for signaling within the plant, they must work together to provide the proper function to stimulate root and leaf development, enhance disease resistance, reduce physiological disorders in the plant, and then promote timely fruit ripening of high quality fruit. Many of you are familiar with this important role, where calcium is vital in maintaining the structure and the function of cells in roots and shoots. One important role of calcium is to bind these cell walls together into a stable functional unit. This example of banana peels is a great way to show the benefit of adequate calcium. You can see in this image that the cell walls become thicker and healthier on the right when, addition, when adequate calcium is present. This allows the fruit to stay fresh longer and to avoid browning over a longer period of time, resulting in the all-important longer shelf life. Now, there's many other benefits of calcium that we can't discuss today due to limited time, but just thought this was an interesting one to highlight. In this work by the research group of KEA, they reported that the addition of calcium nitrate actually helps crops overcome salt damage. Strawberry yields in saline conditions with the addition of calcium nitrate was not quite as good as the no salt treatment, but they were still quite satisfactory for what we consider to be salt sensitive strawberries. Their work showed the same beneficial effect for cucumbers and for cantaloupe, that calcium had an ameliorating effect on salt damage. Now it's not immediately intuitive that adding more fertilizer to a salty soil will help the plant thrive, but in this case the extra calcium resulted in a hardier and a ro more robust plant that could withstand that salt stress. And recall too that strawberries have a physiological preference for nitrate nutrition, which could also account for some of the increased yields and salt tolerance. Let's briefly discuss the role of calcium for resisting plant diseases and its interaction with nutritional deficiency. There was a nice publication released recently on mineral nutrition and plant disease. There's a great chapter in that book on the interaction of calcium with disease um, that we can't go into detail today, but if there's interest, maybe we can dive deeper into that topic in a future chat. In general, a primary function of calcium is building strong cell walls and membranes. So as the first line of defense in protecting plants against pathogens, calcium is extremely effective at helping plants resist the many pests and diseases they're exposed to. So calcium has several different roles. Calcium provides stronger cell walls and better integrity of the membranes, which is a mechanical resistance. Calcium also hastens the leaf hardening, and then a hardened leaf is less susceptible to attack by insects and different vectors. And then finally, adequate calcium can reduce some of the enzymes that are produced by fungi or bacteria that allow them to penetrate the leaf tissue. Now, leaf analysis of the calcium concentration is not always a good indicator of the fruit 
calcium content because there's no direct connection between the leaf tissue calcium and the fruit tissue calcium concentrations. Again, you'll recall that calcium moves into the plant by mass flow and then moves through the plant in the transpiration stream to that area of the plant that's losing the most water. Commonly, this is the upper canopy or the new, younger, expanding leaves. So these are the tissues that typically end up with the greatest calcium concentration and not necessarily in the fruit or the harvested portion of the plant. So it's really quite common to have adequate calcium concentrations in the leaf for the plant to grow, yet have worrisome low calcium concentrations in the fruit, such as apple, strawberry, watermelon, or where the fruit yield and quality are negatively impacted. Let's spend our remaining time together discussing the critical importance of calcium for crop quality. A recent p publication by Wang et al. nicely outlined all the many ways that calcium is involved in growing crops with both high quality and high yields. And then they point out the wide range of problems that emerge when adequate calcium is lacking in the root zone. Their publication makes a nice overview that we don't have time to go into all the detail here, but they point out that adequate calcium for plants is important for the quality of the produce, as shown here both as pre-harvest and then calcium is critical for maintaining the post-harvest quality of all produce. The role of calcium in promoting high-quality produce, I think, is fairly well known. So let's just take these last few minutes to quickly go through some examples of where calcium deficiency either reduces yields or the quality of many common crops. Um, in this case, we're looking at apples, where calcium deficiency often results in a syndrome called bitter pit, where the apples fail to form good cell walls and membranes leading to dark spots internally and externally here on the surface. You can see in this cross-section of an apple where this failure to develop good cell walls and membranes lead to these black spots. And that is not only an apple that's not very appetizing to eat, it does not hold up well in storage as these membranes and cell walls continue to break down and the apple becomes totally rotten. Cabbage is a crop we see evidence of calcium deficiency sometimes where the calcium does not move all the way to the edges of the leaf, those calcium deficiency symptoms start to develop, especially inside the head of the cabbage where there's not much transpiration going on nor much calcium movement. We see that in the internal tissue of this cabbage here where due to a lack of calcium, the tissue is now brown and that cabbage is going to start to break down when it's put in storage. Get another example, um, this time of some Chinese cabbage, where a lack of calcium impacts, again, that internal tissue where there's a lack of transpiration and calcium accumulation, and then also at the leaf tips where browning occurs and some of these dark spots start to develop. We see this in lettuce commonly, again, where there's a lack of adequate calcium moving up into the young tissue and those cells fail to develop properly. Another example from lettuce where those leaf tips do not accumulate sufficient calcium to form strong cell walls and membranes. We observe calcium deficiency in a number of the brassica species, um, in this case cauliflower, a lack of calcium can affect the leaves, especially along the leaf margins, but more importantly, it also impacts the quality of the harvested portion, that head of the cauliflower. Strawberry is another one that we worry about getting enough calcium there. In this picture, we see the evidence of calcium deficiency on leaf growth. Again, those leaf margins are starting to die, but even more importantly, an adequate supply of calcium is essential for good strawberry fruit to make those cell walls firm, make those membranes secure, and that allows the strawberries to stay fresh for a longer period of time 
and they can be transported and moved for many days before they start to break down. Potatoes is another crop where we worry about getting enough calcium into the tuber. Where there's a lack of calcium, often the potatoes develop this internal problem called brown spot, where again the cell walls and membranes aren't forming properly. So this is a potato that wouldn't be very appetizing to eat, but also during storage, that brown spot continues to increase in size and those potatoes begin to rot in storage. Another malady of potatoes is this internal rust spot. Again, this black or brown tissue that develops inside the potato that continues to grow while that potato's in storage. We see this example of cucumbers, both on the leaves and then the fruits, where the end of that cucumber fruit, the one that's furthest away from the vine end, doesn't develop properly, and that turns brown and begins to rot eventually. We call this phenomenon blossom end rot, which again is the end of the fruit that's furthest away from the vine, which is where the blossom is, and that's the blossom end that doesn't get enough calcium, often if there's calcium deficiency in the soil. So we see that occurring here on watermelons. We see that blossom end rot occurring frequently in peppers, again at the tip, furthest away from the stem. But perhaps best known blossom end rot is known in tomatoes, where that end where the blossom was begins to rot, turn brown, and then the whole fruit begins to be spoiled. So as we wrap up our discussion today, let's recall that it's essential that roots are continually bathed in a calcium-rich solution in the soil. That calcium is taken up at the root tips of young roots and then moved throughout the plant to wherever new cells are being formed with the transpiration stream. This calcium-rich soil solution is in a complex equilibrium with soil cation exchange sites, soil minerals, and whatever calcium-rich fertilizer or soil amendments might be present. And then there's a dynamic interplay between all of these that's required to continually replace the soluble calcium in, in the soil solution as it's taken up by the roots. So as we wrap up today, we've had a quick overview of the role of calcium in the plant, but we were not able to touch on many of the important aspects of calcium nutrition and its important in plant health. So if there's issues you'd like to go into greater detail, I'd be glad to address that in a future agronomy talk. So put your questions or comments in the chat or comment section below, and we'll address those at a future time. In the meantime, we're fortunate at Yara to have a staff of very well-trained agronomists that can answer all your questions related to plant nutrition and fertilizer, but especially about the critical role of calcium and what it can do to support high yields and high quality produce. So feel free to reach out to me or to our agronomy staff at yara.us and we'll do our best to help you answer those questions. And I look forward to visiting with you again soon in an upcoming agronomy talk.